has said on your heart, uh, please share it with us. Thank you for being here. Amen. Well, I'm grateful and honored that uh, Rev has asked me to deliver the final part of the series that we started uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1. If we could all please just stand real quickly for the reading of the word. His word is so holy. Amen. Let's honor his word this morning. Um, I'm just going to recap uh, the primary, uh, the central verse within the passage. We started, uh, we read verse 1 through 11, but we're going to start at verse 5. Just read 5 through 7. If you could turn to that portion. We got from six? Okay, that's fine. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Not of fear, but power, love, and self-control. Amen? Let's all bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to deep, deeply dive into your word, Lord God. And we ask that you would just open up our hearts our mind, our spirit, our ears, Lord, everything, Lord God, to hear and receive from you and from your word today, Lord God, that we could take it and apply it to our lives and leave this place strengthened, encouraged, Lord, and with some practical ways that we can find to serve you better, Lord God. You are so worthy this morning, Lord. May you be glorified in all that is said and all that is done. May your glory be put on full display this morning, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so... As we started out the series, uh, we were talking about these are gifts from God. And as pastors mentioned earlier, you have power. That's good, right? So like, yeah, power. I want power from God. And love. Oh, well, who doesn't want love, right? Everyone wants love. But, oh, yeah. And, oh, self-control. Oh, that's like, you know, that's a gift? I, I, as you read the passage, you're like, yeah, power, love. S self-control. Wait, what's that about? That sounds like work. That doesn't sound like a gift. That sounds like. Wait, that's, that's not the, it doesn't seem like it's on the same level as, uh, as the other uh, two gifts that he gives us. It's kind of like I remember when I was a kid at Christmas time, and you know, the family's all gathered. you got the aunts and the uncles and grandma and grandpa and mom and dad. Everybody's there, and they're passing around the gifts. And oh, I mean, the tree is like piled with gifts, right? And you're just, just pulling them out. And here, this one's for George. And you get, all right, open up. Yay, black socks. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, real exciting when you're like 12 years old. You don't think of black socks for Christmas. And, oh, thanks, Auntie. You know, when your motor coat gives you black socks, it's not a good thing. So um, I kind of was looking at it like that, like, wow, well, this, you know, I don't get the exciting one, you know, <laughs> I thought. But in, in researching this and looking into it, I found that actually it's, it's I think, probably the best one. It's very, very powerful. Um, so we need to fan into flame all three of these gifts, power, love, and self-control. So Rev covered uh, power and love. Today we're going to look at self-control. Um, I remember years ago seeing a bumper sticker. Actually, I bought one. It said, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I bought one thinking, oh, that's so great, that's so great. And I went to church one day and I told somebody about it. Hey, guess what? It says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And they, they didn't look too happy. They're like, what's wrong? That's cool, isn't it? They said, well, really, it's God said it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. And, you know, I, that, I bring that to, to, uh, to your attention this morning because I thought about um, the Scripture, and I was digging deep trying to figure out, you know, self-control, self-discipline. Like, is there something more to it? And I'm researching and researching, looking deeper and deeper. And what I found out is, nope, God said it. That settles it. That's what it is. It's just, it's self-control. The only thing I found was that there are some other versions that talk about um, being of sound mind and sound judgment. And what I got from all of that, when you pull all that together, is God gives us wisdom, sound mind, sound judgment, to exercise that self-control and that self-discipline that we need to do, so that we need to exercise. So he gives us that godly wisdom. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word self-control, I'm really leery about when I see the word self See, because you don't know George like I know George. And I don't trust myself. I don't trust my flesh. I don't trust self. When I see self, I'm worried. And when I self-control, I'm like, oh, great. So that means like, so I'm in charge? Oh, that's, <laughs> that could be a disaster because I, prior to becoming a Christian, you don't even want to know what I got involved in, but I ran my life into the ground. I mean, completely destroyed myself, my reputation, my life, hurt almost everybody I knew. Um, and so I was a little bit concerned when I started to read into this. And uh, 
I came across a scripture, Romans chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 14. So I just really can relate with the Apostle Paul. And this is a really deep scripture. We're just going to go through it. We're not going to be able to unpack it all because it really, it's really deep. But um, we're going to start at verse 14. And it talks about the, the battle that the Apostle Paul, the battle within and the battle with sin. <clears throat> so starting at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Maybe some of us can relate to that, amen? It's so refreshing to hear somebody so, so transparent, so honest. He says, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that, it, that the law is good. It's good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, then it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find, listen to this, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God. You hear that? He's, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members another law, I see in my members another law warring against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. I've been there. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Sounds like a real downer, huh? She's going down, down, down. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. Sounds like there's no hope. But he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So we see there's a real battle going on there, amen? There's a real battle going on. So before we unpack that, um, I'm just, like I said before, grateful for the Apostle Paul, you know, and his transparency, his honesty here, because we all battle with sin, amen? Is anybody here perfect? You raise your hand if you're any perfect people, no? Well, I'm far from it myself, amen? But, you know, if we back up, before we unpack that, let's back up to verse 7, which you didn't read. It says this, what shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known what sin was, for I would not have known what it is to covet unless the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So, I meant to bring a mirror up here. I forgot to do that. So, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the law of God is like a mirror. It shows us who we really are. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not kill or murder. Thou shalt not steal. Right? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or thy neighbor's anything else. Right? The law shows us who we really are. But when you see who you really are, what do you do about it? If you see that you're filthy, dirty, you come home from work, you're all sweaty, filthy, dirty, or I've been doing a yard project the last few days out there in the sun and just come in the house and I'm just like, my girls run up, Daddy, I'm like, no, no, don't, don't even touch me. I'm just, oh, I'm just so dirty. I'm soil all over me. You see you're filthy, dirty, what do you do? You get the mirror and you clean yourself with a mirror? Does anybody here clean themselves with a mirror? I hope not. <laughs> not going to work very well. The law isn't supposed to clean us. The law isn't what saves us. It's what shows us who we really are in God's sight. But the law isn't what cleans us. The blood of Jesus is what cleanses us of all sin and washes us. But we wouldn't know that we're dirty unless we had a mirror, which is the law. It shows us who we really are and how we really are in God's sight. Um, you ever, I don't know, maybe this is, embarrassing, but you ever had a, like a booger in your nose, right? And you didn't know? And nobody told you? <laughs> and you got to go through like half the day, and then it's like lunchtime, you go in the bathroom, wash your hands, you look in the mirror like, oh my God, why didn't anybody tell me? You know, sometimes we need a mirror to show us how we really are, and that's what the law is. Um, let, me, let me ask you guys four quick questions. Uh, has anybody here ever lied? Raise your hand if you've ever told a lie. Okay, some of you are lying right now. <laughs> didn't even raise your hand. I know you're... <laughs> okay. Let me try that again. Play along. 
Okay, just play along. It's okay. Loosen up. Have you ever lied? Have you told even a little lie? Just even a little teensy weensy lie. Have you ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on. Come on. Come on. You're in church. At least don't lie here. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. Have you ever stolen anything? Raise your hand if you've ever taken anything. Now, how could I believe you? You just told me you're a liar. Okay, so we've all taken things that didn't belong to us, even if it's just a paperclip from work, and you oh, I need that paperclip at home. You know. All right, so we've, we've lied, we've stolen. Uh, how about, um, have you ever hated anybody? You ever hated anybody? Raise your hand if you ever hated anybody. Come on. Yeah, road rage, come on. I've seen some of you out there pulling out of the driveway right here. I saw you. Okay, so, you know, Jesus said, if you have hatred in your heart, for your brother. He says, you're guilty of murder. You've murdered him in your heart. He said, you've murdered him in your heart because given time and opportunity, you might actually go and do something like that. You might kill him if you really hate him. So, and what about lust? Have you ever looked upon somebody with lust? Lusted after somebody? Uh Uh-oh, tightened up in here. Uh Uh-oh, shh, don't talk about that. Okay, so Jesus said, if you have lust in your heart, he said, you're guilty, you're an adulterer in your heart, even if you haven't done it. You're, adulterer, you're an adulterer in your heart. So just based on those four questions, we've all admitted that we're thieves, liars, adulterers at heart, and murderers. That's the mirror. That's what the mirror is showing us right now. That's, that's who I am. That's who I am. So is that mirror going to save me? Can I clean all that away with a mirror? Can I scrub myself down with a mirror? Is that going to do any good? It's only the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only the grace of God. Now, the good thing is, the good news, the very good news, as always, is that Jesus loves us and that we are saved by his grace, not by works, not by earning it, not by deserving it. We're saved by his grace. Amen? So, regardless of what the mirror says, when we stand before God, if we have the blood of Jesus, it covers, washes away all sin. God looks down. He doesn't see all that. He he sees all that's been washed away, all that's been put on Jesus. It's no longer on us as Christians. Amen? So let's quickly unpack that scripture, though, and go back to the battle within. So Paul, like us, he says, I know what's right to do. I know right and wrong, and I desire to do what's right. But often, he says, he finds himself doing wrong. So there's a battle between our old man, the sinful nature within us that wants to sin. We don't have to be taught to sin. We're born. We already know how to sin. Even little children start fighting, mine, 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 pulling. Not, not my kids. Yeah, right. <laughs> They're not here. They left. Okay, now I can talk about them. Okay, so. Um, but, um, you know, we don't have to be taught to sin. It's naturally within us. But it's a battle between the old sinful nature and the new life that we have in Christ. There's a constant battle going on there. So, what is the answer? What's the answer? How do we win? Well, I'm going to give you some practical tips. So, if you want to have a, have a pen, I'm going to take down some notes. You want to jot some of this down real quickly. First, you've got to kill the flesh. Oh, that's drastic. Well, that's what the Bible says. It doesn't say to lock it in a cage. It, say, it says kill the flesh. The Apostle Paul said to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify means to kill. Kill the deeds of the flesh. He also said, I die daily. Every day, he said, when I get up, I have to kill the flesh because the old man keeps coming back. It's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going. You kill him today, he's right back. You're, you're good right now, but 20 minutes after you leave church, boom, you get hit with something. And your old, the old flesh, the nature, wants to rise up, wants to take control. It's a battle over who's going to sit on the throne of your heart. But how do we win? You kill the flesh. Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that from now on, we should not serve sin. Amen? We have to crucify that old man with Christ. You know what? Put it under the blood of Jesus. You have to make a decision and a choice that you're going to follow Jesus Christ. And you're going to live the way that he's called us to live. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I love this verse. Galatians 2, 20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You get that? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live 
by the grace or by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ would be dead in vain. So we have to crucify the flesh, amen? You guys aren't excited about that. <laughs> but we have to crucify the flesh, the old man. There's a battle going on. We ha- and if, you're gonna, if you have any chance at all of winning that battle, you have to have your mind made up that you're going to die to self. The old habits, the old way, the old nature, the old man has to die. Amen. So, secondly, we need to be filled with the, with the Holy Spirit. So first, kill the flesh. Second, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, like I said before, I don't trust myself, my flesh. If it's up to me, I've seen, what I, I've, I've seen the decisions I make on my own outside of the Spirit of God. I've seen the trouble I can get myself into. So I realize that it's not just self-control, but having the wisdom to give God control. Because with the Spirit of God in you, you can have the strength to resist sin. You have the strength. God gives you the strength. He says there's three gifts, power, love, and a sound mind or self-control. The wisdom and the strength to make that decision and that commitment that I'm not going to fall to sin. And if I do, I have an advocate with the Father. We fall on His grace. Amen? I've heard it said that if you're going to fall, fall forward. Fall toward God. At least if you're going to fall, fall toward God. Fall into His arms. Lord, I'm sorry. I blew it again. Repent. Turn from it. No one's perfect. Amen? Amen? No one's perfect. We're not perfect. So we need to not just be about self-control, but give God control, amen? Rely on him. He's the only one that we can rely on. So how do we do this? How does this play out in our daily lives? How do we give <clears throat> excuse me, God control? Well, first real tip you might want to write down is that which you feed will live, and that which you starve will die. Anybody ever grow plants? Anybody have gardens, grow plants? Yeah. If you feed them, give them water, they live, right? If you don't, what happens? They die. Sometimes they die anyway. But <laughs> that's a whole different story. I, I'm, I can testify to that. Feed them and water them, they still die. Sometimes it's just the sun that burns them up. But anyway, uh, what you feed will live and what you starve will die. So how do you feed the spiritual man? Because remember, there's a battle. There's the new nature and the old nature, and they're battling. You want to feed the new nature, your spiritual man or woman. Amen? First is the Word, the Word of God. That's our spiritual food. They say you are what you eat, right? You've heard heard that? You are what you eat. Well, if you eat fat, greasy food, you're going to be a fat, greasy dude. It's 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 just how it is. Well, here's your spiritual food. It's the Word of God. Either you're feeding or you're not feeding, and your spiritual man is dying because he's not getting the Word of God. So many ways, a prayer, connection with God. You've got to strengthen your inner man. Fellowship with other believers to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help you when you start going off on some tangent, thinking some weird thoughts or misinterpreting the Bible, you need fellowship, which is what we're doing right now here, uh, gathering together and also afterwards in the social hall. You know, if you're going through something, that's the time to talk with somebody. Amen? Get some encouragement. Uh, worship takes you into the presence of God. You know, there's so many ways that you can feed what you want to live, which is your spiritual man. Uh, devotional time as well. What you starve will die. So how do you starve the old man? Well, first, watch what you're watching. Pay attention to what you're watching. See these two things right here? They take in a whole lot of stuff, don't they? And all that goes in, and it feeds your mind, feeds your heart. This is like the windows. What are you letting in? Watch what you're watching. Amen? We need to watch what we're watching. Pay attention to that. Uh, listen to what we're hearing. What are, who, who and what are we listening to? Because that also is a way that, gets, that feeds the inside. So whether for good or for bad, for better or for worse. Amen? Watch what we're listening, watch what you're watching, listen to what you're listening to. Think about what you're thinking. What are you thinking? What's influencing your thoughts? Are you going off on some weird tangent? Some strange ideas? Or is your thinking in line with the word of God? Where do you go? Where are the places that you go? And who are you with? You need to make sure that you're 
paying attention to these things. These are commitments. These are things that we need to watch, watch out for and be aware of. I get invited to go places with people, and I'm like, no, I don't think so. There, when, I was, uh, first, when I first became a Christian, it took a while for me to let go of a lot of things. And there were friends that would still invite me to parties, and I would go, and you stand there, and you're just like, so what do I do? I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't cuss. And that's what everybody else is doing. And so it's like, why am I even here at this party? There's nothing to do. I'd stand there bored. You know, you got to watch where you're going because, I've heard, well, I've heard it said that if you have five people that get into an elevator and one is a Christian and four are not, let's say the elevator breaks down, it's there, it's broken down for a couple days. They say when you come back and you open up the doors of that elevator, you're more likely to have five unbelievers than five believers. Those four, those four non-believers are more likely to influence that, that believer into not continuing to serve God than the other way around. You need to watch who you're hanging around with. Make sure that there's somebody that's going to lead you closer to God, somebody that's giving you a, a positive influence toward God, toward the gospel. If you're hanging around people that are completely negative toward the gospel, you need to either be bringing them closer to God or you need to maybe put some separation there, you know, for a time. Make sure that you're strong in God. Amen? So, there's the three S's. So that's, that's the first practical tip is feed, what you feed will live and what you starve will die. The three S's, surrender. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses uh, 19 and 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and you, which you have from God, and you are not your own. You hear that? We are not our own. We need to surrender our lives to God. He said, for you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Apostle Paul tells us very clearly that our temple, is the, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he lives within us. Amen? And we are not our own. But we've been bought with a price. When you have surrendered your life to God, it leads to sanctification. Sanctification is a process of spiritual growth. And that when it comes, as you are sanctified and grow in Christ, begins to show itself in service. And you have a heart to serve others. Amen? So as we give God control of our lives, and we surrender, and we continue to grow in Christ, sanctification happens. And when we are led by Christ, we are led to serve. So I said it was called self-control, or the, the message is self-control versus self-love. Self-control we've talked about. We need to use the wisdom that God gives us to make good and godly decisions. Uh, to exercise self-control. Don't just rely on ourselves, but give God control of our lives. Starve the flesh. Feed the spirit. Surrender our lives to God. Grow in Christ when we do that. Sanctification. And that leads to service. Getting involved, making a difference with our lives. Now, what's self-love? Well, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, people take that scripture and they really bend it out of what it really means. He's not commanding us to love ourselves. You don't have to be told to love yourself. We automatically will love ourselves. Amen? Nobody, who, who starves themselves to death? Who doesn't, you know, take care of yourself? We automatically are going to take care of ourselves. When the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself, it's saying that you need to love your neighbor. You already know how to love yourself. We all do, amen? But we see it everywhere in the world today. And here's the words of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. In the last days, and this could have been written yesterday, in the last days there will be times of difficulty or a great falling away. For people will be lovers of self. Lovers of who? Self. People will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, meaning never satisfied, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, uh-oh, that means he's crept into the church. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power of God. That's a man-centered gospel where it's not about Jesus anymore, but about us. And it says, avoid such people. So the scripture goes on to say that all these people, all that list of people, will be disqualified from the faith. So what should we take home with us today? After all this that we've laid out for you, self-control, self-love, what should we take home with us today? Well, if we're Christians, we need to stay on guard. Amen? We are living in the last days. And it's a, it's a very, very uh, dangerous and dark time. Amen? Um, 
We need to stay on guard, exercise self-control, self rely on and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't follow the self-love mindset that our culture tries to push on us. It's all about me, 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 I, 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 my rights, my, my gender, you know, my will, my way, my everything. It's all about us. We're the, the me generation, you know. Have it your way at Burger King, right? You know, that old, that old slogan they had. It's all about us. That is not the way God would have us to live. It's not. It's completely opposite. We need to consider others before we consider ourselves. And we need to honor God because we are not our own. When you're, if we're truly Christians, we surrender our rights. I don't have any rights. I'm a slave to Christ. What he says goes. Where he says to go, I go. Amen? There's so much power in surrender. People live their lives closed-fisted, wanting to control, control freaks, want to be in control of everything and everyone and everybody's, everybody's life and ours and everyone else's around us. And we live like this. But there's so much power in living a life like this, open-handed, so a surrendered life where God can put something in your hand and you can take it and give it to someone else. God can't put anything into a hand like this. Amen. Amen. So the, the world is looking for people who have something real, and I pray to God that that's us. So if you're new to the faith, I just want to close with this. If you're new to the faith and you're struggling today, because you might be thinking, man, I'm in big trouble. Listening to that list of all those things, I'm like, man, I, yes, this, I do that, I do this and that. I struggle with this, I struggle with that. So maybe uh, you're battling today. I want you to have, take heart today if you're still battling with sin. Did you hear me? Take heart today if you're still battling with sin. Why? Because it means that you haven't given up on God. You're still battling. At least you're battling, right? At least you're trying. You may be struggling. You may be losing more than you're winning, but you're still fighting. Amen? It means that you haven't. It's a sign that you have not given up on God. But be thankful. Be thankful to God that His Spirit is still convicting you of sin. When we, when we mess up, we need to be thankful to God that we still feel His Spirit convicting us because that means that God hasn't given up on us. There was a, a young child that was walking through the mud with his father, and the mud was like about a foot and a half deep, really super thick, sticky mud. And he said, Papa, let me hold your hand so I won't fall. And he would hold on to his, his, his little child, so he just, the Papa put his finger out. The little child's holding on to the finger, and he's trying to walk, and he kept slipping, and he kept falling, kept falling, kept falling, because he was relying on him holding on to his father's hand. Finally, he said, Papa, can you hold my hand? And when the father took his hand, he didn't fall. Because the father had more strength than the son. And our father has more strength than we do. So if we're battling, if we're struggling, it's not, just, not such a bad thing, amen? Because you need to fight on. It is a fight. It is a fight. Are you in the battle? Because it's a fight. But we serve a God who can hold on to us, amen? Amen? and can strengthen us and hold us up. I just want to thank you, um, Pastor. I want to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. I hope you got something out of it, something you can apply in your daily lives. It's a battle, guys, and it's a battle that can be won. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we thank you for your word that you've spoken into our lives. We pray, Lord God, that you would just strengthen us, encourage us, Help us, Lord, to apply these things in our daily lives, to surrender ourselves to you, Lord, to realize that we're not our own, but we've been bought with a price. We belong to you, Lord. Have your way in our lives each and every day. Give us the strength to exercise self-control. Lord God, give us the strength to fight this battle that you've given to us, Lord God, that you've laid before us. May we honor you, Lord, with our lives. And when we struggle, may we rely on you. We're so grateful for your mercy, for your grace, Lord God and the love that you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.